Welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be diving back into The Last of Us. Now the medical science in the first episode was really pretty clever and loads of you commented that they expand on it even more in this episode so I'm excited to see what they do. I'll also try and weave in some of your other great comments that I read from my last reaction because there's a bunch of stuff I missed. As always this is going to be riddled with spoilers and some gory scenes too and just so you know I have to keep the clips of the show super short because otherwise I'll get pinged for copyright. With that out the way let's check out episode two. It really wouldn't be a zombie movie without a scientist in a hazmat suit. In this case, the post-mortem from one of the first victims. Even without spreading a mind-bending fungus, human bites can be really pretty nasty and are likely to get infected. So if the skin's broken, we'd want to cover the patient with oral antibiotics. When she makes the incision, we can see the fungus here that's been growing under the skin. And there's probably a bit of pus there as well, so some dead neutrophils from the inflammatory reaction. We've seen a few times these vein-like projections that come out from the wounds. Now these are likely the hyphae, so the tendril root-like growths that enable fungi to spread. And this relates back to the first episode where we saw the different time periods to full infection. 5 to 15 minutes for head, face and neck and up to 24 hours if infected in the leg or foot. And I theorised that the incubation period was likely the time taken from the hallucinogenic chemical to travel to the brain rather than the fungus itself to travel there given the fact it happened so quickly. But actually, I think it's more likely the symptoms are caused by the actual fungus migrating to the brain. Hence, the further the infected body part is from your brain, the longer it would take for the fungus to grow from there to your brain. I think this is less realistic than it's the chemical traveling to your brain because organisms don't grow that fast, but this is the in-universe explanation that this is some kind of super fungus and really does grow that fast. It's also completely reasonable to think that once you are infected, there'll be some kind of secondary spread through our bodies, like spores traveling through the blood and lymphatic system. Yes, so we kind of see what we've just been talking about here. These finger-like projections here that we see wriggling around would be the hyphae, so the tendrils that would be spreading through our body and would be creating a, a huge network called a mycelium. And as we mentioned, they're growing way too fast to be realistic. Looks like some kind of sped up wildlife documentary, but that is the in-universe explanation here for why the incubation period is so quick. It's also worth noting that fungi don't actually move. They don't have any kind of motility apparatus. They just grow from wherever they land as a spore and if successful, will spread locally before producing more spores. Kurang lebih 30 jam yang lalu, Bu. Di mana? Di pabrik tepung dan gabah di barat kota. Lahan yang sempurna. Very good. So I think what they're suggesting here that initially the global spread was put down to it being transmitted, the fungus being transmitted via flour and grain, which makes a lot of sense and goes some way to explain in the first episode why no one had really heard of the fungus until it was everywhere. And thanks to everyone that mentioned this in the comments of the last video, because I probably wouldn't have picked up on it, but this has a precedent. In 1951, in the southern French town of Ponson Esprit, a mill had its flour colonized by claviceps fungus, ended up poisoning around 250 people and resulting in seven deaths. And this is no doubt an inspiration for the story here, as this fungus also produced alkaloid chemicals similar to that of LSD, meaning many of the people infected suffered neurological symptoms such as confusion, convulsions and ended up being admitted to asylums. You can imagine if something like that happened today with our global distribution, it could cause a huge outbreak, although no doubt we use a lot more antifungals in our production, but equally, fungi are becoming more resistant. Either way, this is very realistic and links back into the World Health Organization report we talked about in the last video on the emerging threat of fungi, which mentioned international travel and trade as a risk factor. And one of my favorite comments from the last video was the reason why Joel didn't initially get infected is because he was on the Atkins diet. Y'all want some biscuits? I do. 
but I'm on Atkins. So a low carb diet, meaning he was avoiding things like bread and grains. So great little touch. Thanks for pointing it out. I would never have figured it out myself. Tidak ada obat dan tidak ada vaksin. Bom. <laughs> what? Straight for the bum? Has she got chairs in arms dealing or something? Yeah, this does seem like a bit of an extreme reaction, particularly from a scientist. I think she's been watching too much of that movie Outbreak, where <laughs> the government's response was just to bomb the immediate area. But obviously one of the keys to an outbreak initially is containment and the fact she knows that the flour and grain have also been implicated in the spread means the genie is kind of out of the bottle, so I don't know what bombing the hell out of a city is gonna do. And regarding treatment and medication, is there something I'm missing here? Because we have antifungals that we use in reality for invasive candida and aspergillus. Is it the case that these don't work on cordyceps? I don't know. Or possibly this is a plot device in the story to make the fungus seem scarier because I'm guessing a professor of mycology would know if medication is likely to work on it. Having no vaccines for fungal infections is certainly true though, and there's lots of research going into this, given the public health concern from fungal resistance, fungi adapting to climate change, and the risk of spread from international travel and trade. Do I look like I'm infected? Show us your arm. Ellie's arm wound looks to be healing up nicely, but I think Joel is absolutely right to be wary here. In the last episode, we saw she continues to test positive, and this highlights a principle of medicine. Know what your test is actually measuring. Because if it is a direct measure of the fungus, then Ellie might actually be an asymptomatic carrier, and therefore may still be contagious, and have the potential to infect someone with close contact, for example, if they shared food with her. In that regard, Ellie might be some kind of typhoid Mary who was a cook back in New York in the early 20th century, and although she had no symptoms herself, managed to kill between three and 50 people from giving them typhoid during the food she prepared. Broken. Okay. Maybe a hairline. It'll heal fast. That's a bit of a classic uh, medical misconception, actually, but I don't think it's a mistake in the show because it's unlikely that Joel is going to know <laughs> the different types of fractures. A hairline fracture or stress fracture is a break in the bone that occurs from multiple trauma over a long amount of time, so not from a one-off punch. And because of this, we usually sit in athletes or military personnel and usually in the leg or foot. It's caused by the remodeling, so the strengthening of the bone not able to keep up with the repetitive damage. So in this instance, it's more likely Joel means a closed non-displaced fracture, so one that doesn't break the skin and one where the two bony fragments are well aligned. He says it's gonna be quick to heal. It's probably gonna take six to eight weeks. It's like a f***ed up moon. Is this where they bombed? Yeah. They hit most of the big cities like this. For a minute there, I wondered how all the buildings could have been wrecked by the zombies, but then I remembered <laughs> the bombs. They obviously took the advice of the scientists. Bomb. So there aren't super infected that explode fungus spores on you? Shit, I hope not. <laughs> or ones with split open heads that stay in the dark like so we briefly mentioned about spores in the last episode. So it looks like the disease is transmitted through human bites, possibly ingesting contaminated food like the grain, but the fungus itself probably grows in the environment too, so outside of a human host, and it's highly likely it does this through spores. But certainly from what we've seen so far, it doesn't appear that spores can infect humans all that easily. And many of you commented that in the video game that spores were one of the main methods of infection and that it's less likely that it's a feature of the spread in the TV adaption because they wouldn't want the characters to all be wearing gas masks all the time. You know, you couldn't possibly have an actor like Pedro Pascal and not show his face all the time. 
We mentioned in the last video that spores such as Aspergillus can cause atypical pneumonia, so lung infections, and spores are capable of causing significant outbreaks in the right population. Just look at the fairly recent mucormycosis outbreak in India in 2021, where around 4,000 people died, and this was thought to have been exacerbated by people's immune system being weakened, either by COVID-19 directly or from them being on steroids treating a COVID-19 infection. Well, some last about a month or two. But there's others, been walking around about 20 years. Nice bit of bonding time here, chatting about <laughs> how long infected people live for. And around a month or two kind of makes sense because that's the extreme amount of time you can probably live for without food. And I'm guessing the people infected don't really have a healthy appetite. Obviously, you can only live for a few days without water, so they must be getting their hydration from somewhere. The fungus also grows underground. Long fibers like wires, some of them stretching over a mile. You step on a patch of cordyceps in one place, and you can wake a dozen infected from somewhere else. Wow, I like this. So the fungus has actually spread under the ground in like a giant tubular network, which <laughs> makes the story even more terrifying. And someone in the comments on the last video talked about how some fungi demonstrate primitive type memory within this network, despite not having a brain or a nervous system of any kind. Obviously, I'm no expert on fungi, but I think it's more akin to them reinforcing their mycelium network based on if they find nutrients or water or even go along the path of least resistance. It's kind of like that slime mold organism. So a plasmodium, not a fungus, but it was nicknamed the blob as it was one giant cell that would essentially forage with these tentacle-like projections and if it found some food would send chemicals to enhance the growth of that tentacle. And if there wasn't anything useful, it wouldn't grow along that route and therefore over time it would end up organizing itself into this efficient tubular network connecting everything it needed. And we are seeing this type of thing in The Last of Us, the cordyceps here covering the buildings in their network. So these are the hyphae reaching out to find food and water. And these are pretty dense here. So no doubt they've ended up finding something they like. And so growth has been stimulated. And from what the characters are saying here, the cordyceps fungus is using this mycelium network, not only to share nutrients and water, but also to communicate when it feels vibrations to then wake the door infected in the area to hunt for more victims. It's bone dry. Could mean they're all finally dead in there. Cool, so this is reassuring and obviously the character Joel knows this. The hyphae tendrils have dried out so the chemicals would be no longer able to travel down them and to communicate with the larger mycelium network. So at some point, the resources, the water and nutrients that this part of the network had foraged have now been depleted. So this part of the network dies. And this nicely links back to what Joel said earlier about how long an infected can live for, around two to three months, because it's likely that the mycelium network actually supplies the infected with water while they're in this dormant stage, waiting to be woken up to hunt for humans and presumably other animals too. So the fact this hyphae is dry hints that all the dormant infected people in the area are probably dead. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's my Halloween outfit sorted for this year. Earlier in the episode, Ellie said she'd heard of infected that have their heads split open and can see in the dark, so I'm guessing <laughs> these dudes are where she's heard that rumor from. The pattern here does look a lot like the folds of the brain, what we call the gyri of the brain, but I'm guessing this is the fungus growing around the head, not the brain outside the head or maybe the fungus has invaded through the skull. And if we look closely, I think that's what's happened here because we can see the maxilla bone here looks to have been eroded away as the fungus has grown through. Sadly, we do sometimes see lesions not too dissimilar to this in the case of fungating tumors. Despite the name, it's got nothing to do with the fungus. It's where we have advanced cancers that have ended up growing through the skin and they can sometimes look a little bit like a fungus. Oh, 
Oh dear. We've seen how much trouble they have with two infected, let alone a whole legion. So we see here the mycelium network essentially being the infected WhatsApp group, letting them know that there is some major stuff going down. And so there you go, another fantastic episode. Really like the inclusion of the flour and the grain being this perfect way to spread globally. And the idea of the mycelium network being sort of underground and connecting everything together and signaling to the infected when there's some fresh meat around. It's just so well thought out. And as with the last video, I'd love to know your thoughts on this episode. I learned so much from the comments in the last video. So let me know what I missed, stuff I got wrong, or just any theories you have too. And if you can drop a like on this video and consider subscribing, that would really help the channel out. Really appreciate you watching. I hope you're all well and I'll be back soon.